Shazad Ismaili was born in the States to Pakistani parents who immigrated here just before his birth. He grew up in a bicultural household, always following a multitude of paths and per usuals. He was mostly self-taught as a musician, composer, recording engineer, and producer. He primarily plays electric bass, drums, percussion, guitar, synthesizers, and all manner of sound makers for crew and lights travel. He has recorded and performed with a diverse crew of art makers, Yoko Ono, Lori Anderson, Beth Horton, Colin Stetson, Ben Frost, Bonnie Prince Billy, Damian Rice, Zoli Holland, Secret Chiefs Three, Sam Amidon, Ragnar Ko Yart Unsen, and many more. He has been an integral member of festival residency collective experience, such as the People Festival, the Eclairs Festival, and the Moors Festival. He has done work for dance and theater, such as Inkboat and visual artist Leila Cora Mian. He's also done music for Oscar nominated and Sundance award winning film Frozen River. This year alone, he'll teach in residence at BAMP, the Oklahoma Center for Contemporary Arts, and the Moyne Hem Triennial. Moyne Heim Triennial. Currently based in Brooklyn and working out of a recording studio collective, he founded and created named Figure Eight Recording. He has studied music extensively in Pakistan, India, Turkey, Mexico, Chile, Japan, Indonesia, Morocco, and Iceland. I would like to introduce to you Shazad Ismaili. Hello, everyone. So um, from what I gather, I meant to say a little bit about uh, myself, um, what I'm currently working on, my process as an artist. And so I'm going to do that until about 2.30 or so, and then engage in a dialogue with, with anyone who's interested in asking some questions or wanting to know more about me or about anything I'm doing with my life or with music or otherwise. Um, let me begin by saying that ever since I was very, very young, I was deeply interested in playing music. Um, Something happened at circa two years old <clears throat> that meant that that was, that was what I deeply wanted to pursue, what I wanted to do with my time and with my life and with my energy and with my um, short time here on the planet, um, as all of us have. Um, I was trying to figure out why I was so interested in playing music, music, given the fact that my family doesn't play. Uh, you know, no one in my extended family plays music or is connected to the arts, really. As far as I know, they're mostly in the sciences and math and engineering and jewelry making and that kind of situation. Um, so I didn't have a predisposition for it due to family, due to being introduced to it by someone in my immediate sphere. And yet I was really deeply pulled to it. Um, one time I went to see a seer that spoke to the dead in Iceland and I decided not to tell her anything. I walked in the door, sat down at the table in front of her and pretty quickly she said, you had a brother and your brother was the musician and that's why you then ended up pursuing music. So what, what happened was I was around two years old and my brother was born and he was missing the wall between the blue blood and red blood in his heart. So he couldn't oxygenate the, uh, his blood. And so he died about six or seven days after he was born. This woman felt that, or maybe spoke to him and understood that he's the musician. And I'm, and as in her terms, in her words, she said, I'm the priest, he's the musician. And when he passed, then he requested that I would play for him. So this is a possible reason why I'm super into music at the moment. And I'm thinking about what it is to be very, very young and be pulled towards something so strongly and and like a like a compass, telos, like teleology, 
that it's your that it's your um it's the string that's that's pulling your spirit in that direction um the reason i've been thinking about that about that a little bit lately is my daughter is dancing all the time and sometimes when i watch her dance i feel like there's a seriousness and a dropping into the experience that reminds me a little bit of how i feel about music so i wonder i'm trying to keep super quiet about it and wait for the years to pass i wonder if that's her pursuit if that's where her heart and interest is and i wonder whether that will be the case i'm just watching and checking it out um I have a few instruments around me. I'm going to play a little bit right now. Um, but before I do, I wanted to mention that as I was learning to play, I'm self-taught. And I started really vigorously learning to play and wanting to play and picking up instruments um, when I was around maybe 18 or 19 or so. I had wanted to play since I was very young, but I started to seriously try to learn the formal aspect of playing an instrument around 18 or 19. And initially, because I have a math and science brain, theory and the architecture of music made a lot of sense to me. So initially, that's what I was consuming. I was buying books about theory, books about how to read music, books about structures and forms and Shankarian analysis and all this kind of business. And I would figure out music like it was a puzzle and like it was geometric objects intersecting with one another. And I was figuring out forms and shapes and chords and this inversion and upside down, this and that. And then uh, I was getting someone good at playing with that, with that way of looking at it. And then I started to watch performances of musicians that seemed to transform the whole space, that seemed to make the room feel like something different. Um, that seemed to captivate the spirit of the room or shift the emotional tone of the room. And I wanted to understand how to do that. And it didn't, to me, it didn't seem to be, it didn't seem to reside in how proficient you were at playing an instrument or how aware you were of the form or the notes or the chords or the composition. It felt like it was something beyond that. And it didn't feel, didn't seem apprehendable uh, from a book or a text or an exercise or something. So in time, there were a few experiences and a few mentors that I watched perform or met or played with along the way that to me felt they were showing that portal, showing where that portal was. In one case, I started to make music for a Butoh dance company in New York. And I still remember a couple of important rehearsals I had with them. To begin with, the rehearsals would be often improvising and image-based movement and sound. So rather than picking up a guitar and thinking, okay, I'll be playing a C chord, and then that will go to some sharp four Lydian scale, and then there'll be this and that, they would say, okay, for both the dancers and the musicians, we'll begin this piece as follows. Imagine that your arms are a thousand birds and they are all sleeping. And then they all begin to move in different directions. They scatter and they scatter out of fear. At the end of the piece, all the birds will come back to sleep, to back to rest. And so that was the only imagistic based, uh, composing point of view for the movement, for the sound. And so I'd pick up the guitar and I would try to hold that image in my mind as strongly as I could and play from that perspective. So I would let go of the more music inside of music point of view, what chord, what note, what scale, what rhythm, what tempo, etc. And I was aiming for something else. And however that came out in terms of sound and chord and organization was secondary to being imbued with the image and bringing the image forward. Um, that helped in that pursuit of looking for feeling and altering the emotional tenor of a space through sound. Then I got to see some musicians, Milford Graves, Mark Rabot, uh, K.G. Hino, Pauline Oliveras, 
all of those folks felt like they were showing a portal through which sound alters feeling or sound affects feeling. And it was less about what note they were playing, what part they were playing, and more about something uh, esoteric or mystical. And that was transpiring. Um, I will pause there on the talking side. I'm going to play for a little bit, just for about 10 minutes or so. Um, some different instruments that are collected around me in the studio. And then I'd love to open the floor for some questions, please. Ivan and I tested the sound earlier, so I hope the testing holds fairly well.
Okay, Q&A time. Hi, Shazad. Hey, just a real quick reminder to the Stetson students who are online to please click on the chat for the link that you need to fill your, fulfill your requirements. Uh, 
I have a question for you, Shazad. Uh, you said at the beginning when you first were going or learning about music and all that, you saw it as an object, as a form. Do you still see the music this way or has, or has it transformed in a different way now? It hasn't transformed because I'm sadly rigidly still myself. I tried really hard to be a different person. It didn't work out. I'm still myself. And therefore, um, even as I'm playing in the more in the most abstract settings, there's still somehow an, an awareness, like a math brain awareness of what's taken place. Shall it occur again? How many more times is this an octagon? That's all still happening. I have not been able to subsume myself uh, into another, another self yet. Okay. Uh, so follow up question. Have you ever thought or have you tried drawing or creating these forms into a 2D design? I haven't because uh, as a, as a deep youngster, I had extreme visual art trauma. There I was in like six, maybe fourth grade and i was slow like i was maybe a little bit too much of a perfectionist so i was making the little paper mache elephant and i couldn't finish it on time and they had already moved on to the construction paper haunted house module and i was still dealing with the paper mache elephant and the teacher said what the fuck is going on we're done with that module and i said i can't get the trunk sorted out and they said, you're, you're terrible at this. And uh, ever since then, I just don't draw, I don't paint. And I'm trying to change that because it's an incredibly meditative, amazing space to get into when you're drawing. And the closest I've come back to that is um, being involved with someone romantically. And you know, as happens when you're involved with someone romantically, you'll do things that are outside your norm, like let let a dog be in the bed with you and things like that. Um, and in this case, it was a woman who was excited about like drawing early in the mornings, like waking up, not saying a word to each other. And before any any verbal exchange would happen, we'd walk into the living room and pull out some paper and light a candle and draw for a while. And that was such a beautiful experience. So no... The shorter answer is no, uh, preceded by the long answer. <laughs> no, uh, thank you for sharing. Mm. Uh, so anybody else has any questions for Shazad? Please approach the mic if you do. You have to go to the mic. Hold on, hold on, Shazad. Right here? Yeah. Is that working? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Shazad. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question about, um, it's, is that I'll, Sonia? It is. Hi. Uh, glad vo vocal recognition software is still happening. Go. <laughs> um, obviously it seems like for you in intention is the form of, is your form of mastery. Like, I feel like that is really resonant uh, even just like in that 10 minute performance. So my question is because I feel like often as musicians, uh, we are kind of told that mastery over one instrument or one medium is like the way to ascension. <laughs> and I'm just curious, you know, it seems like y your ethos kind of contradicts that. So I'm, I'm wondering how how you've navigated and how you've approached that in terms of like, you know, discipline and, and practice and creation. Um, if that's a clear question, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, a few, few answers, a few aspects of an answer. Um, we all have our own dispositions and my disposition is, uh, more uh, excited by ch chaos and newness and change. And we can attribute that to whatever we want. We can attribute it to the fact that I'm, uh, I was born under the Gemini situation. We contribute it to the fact that I moved around a lot as a kid. Like my parents moved every two years. Um, also born to immigrants. So the sort of dissonance of identity and mul the multiplicity of identity. So I have by nature an anti 
boring the hole down three miles of ice into the bottom of the 20 million year old organism in Antarctica. Like that's not my space. And so um, for better and worse, of course. And so um, I ended up instead spreading horizontally across things, touching different instruments and sounds. And to my understanding, noticed that that wide horizontal spread was giving me uh, oddly, counterintuitively, a depth of understanding. Because as you heard sound and intention displayed through, a, through an acoustic guitar, and then through a bass, and then through a drum set, and then through a synthesizer, you started to see cross similarities of intention, of sound, of the way it acts upon a space, acts upon another person and another musician. And so you started to receive some of the same lessons that you get from depth, from singularity, from going down into a singular, singular instrument or singular substance. Um, that's one part of the answer. Another one is just generally about intention. So um, I noticed that with many of the musicians I would play with, particularly the ones I would improvise with, if the intention of your maybe thought, heart, spirit mechanism was really strong, like a, like a slice, like a line cutting through the space, things would coalesce around it. It could change the atmosphere. It could change the palette of what was happening around you if there's a group of musicians. It's almost like, if I can think of it, a good image for it, it's like when you look up in the sky and you see a flock of birds move directions. And it probably started with one bird. I mean, if we could slow down, like shoot in video, go super, super slow motion, probably you could at one moment feel like it was one bird's movement and then shh, the whole flock moves. And it's that kind of, I suppose, feeling that you get a sudden intuition to make a sound, make a statement, make a rhythm, choose a volume, choose a note, and then your own self is like the remaining flock of birds. And then it amplifies into the other musicians on stage and potentially the whole audience. And you all move and shift in this intense, gorgeous, uh, wild way. Um, that is the closest I can get to an answer. Thank you. Any other questions? No, go ahead, ask. If you could do me a favor, also take the mask off. Oh, I think yeah. people, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. I'm back. Um. Is that Sonia again? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. We <laughs> should just go. Yeah. <laughs> just pouring it over into our one on ones. Um, second question uh, is on mentorship. Because you talked mm. a little bit about that. And I'm just curious what that has looked like at different phases in your life. In terms of cultivating that, um, you know, ask, either asking for or trying to build um, mentorship with with elders, or, or you know, or otherwise, um, I think that's something I've struggled with. So I'm just curious what your experience has been. I was very happy to live in New York because I feel like, um, Obviously, I'm the one talking, so all I can do is share my thoughts about it, which uh, will be extremely colored by who this person is. So right or wrong, I'm going to say what I, what, what, how it's been for me. Um, the thing about living in New York that I've appreciated is you get to catch people that you're moved by in social downtime circumstances, and it means that you can begin something together. I feel, I felt like when musicians or artists were on tour coming through a city and now being on the other side of that experience, I felt that when they're coming through on, uh, on tour, the show's over and they're really interested in minimally a couple minutes of talking to someone and then getting to the hotel, turning the heat all the way up, uh, watching a movie, um, ordering some room service, trying to sleep, and then maybe getting into a whole different set of things. Um, and Whereas when you live in New York, you'd go see Mark Rabot play at some concert and then he would just go over to the bar later and just sit down for a while and you would 
sidle up next to him and start talking to him about music. And then you would ask him for his phone number and then he would begrudgingly give it to you. And then you would start cold calling him uh, incessantly until he would let you come over to his apartment. And then he would share some piece of music he was working on. And then you would um, surreptitiously record it on your phone. Uh, and then you would go home and learn it so well that when you were invited over to his house the next time, you would weirdly play it note for note. And then he would be kind of alarmed. And then he would say, hmm, I've got this gig a month from now and I need a bass player for it. Do you want to just try and work on some of these tunes? And then 15 years later, you'd be playing every year for a few weeks a year and become really close friends. Um, in another instance, I saw Milford Graves play and his phone number was stenciled on his drum hardware. So I wrote it down and then I called him and I asked him if I could come visit. And that the beginning of that was a very hardcore hierarchy, like teacher, student, elder, uh, mildly young person. Um, and then it was so beautiful how quickly it evolved into us playing duo concerts together. And in doing that, I was in, for me, I was receiving just as much, maybe if not more, playing on stage with him and trying to watch and perceive and make choices that energetically felt like we were surfing together. Um, that's the best answer at this moment for Sonia. Actually be like, I would love it if you were my mentor. What does that ever a sentence you uttered? Um, no. <laughs> uh, and I think I, why would I not have said that? I wonder, I feel like, okay, first thought, I feel like that would have put me in chains somehow. Um, because I think that saying that sentence would have meant to me, I better be there every Tuesday at 9 a.m. And that's, that's hard for me. That is super tricky. Um, the other quick thing I'll say about that is you can have, you know, I don't quote unquote lateral mentors, meaning someone that is your own age, if not younger, but is blowing your mind in some way. And so you start a relationship where you're learning a lot from them. I was a long time ago wanting to be better at improvising. And I was in a band where another band member, his name was Sam Amadon, beautiful folk singer from Vermont, plays banjo and a fiddle. He also wanted to start to get better at improvising. So we made a plan. I said, Sam, here's my address and uh, my phone number. And what I want to do is anytime you want to come over and play and you only have, you have whatever time you have, like five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, what I want you to do is text me that you're coming over and tell me how much time you have. You walk in the door, we don't say a word to each other and we play for that amount of time and then you walk out the door and we don't socialize, we don't talk about anything and we just meet as often and as randomly as possible. And surprisingly from my way of running my calendar, that meant that he and I played together so often, like Monday morning, 6 a.m. to 6.05 a.m. Tuesday, 1 a.m. at night, uh, 1 a.m. to 2.30 in the morning. Um, you know, it just it just went went like that. And we naturally developed a friendship. Um, we learned a great deal from each other. We still play music a, great, uh, a lot to this day and are really close friends. Uh, I got a couple of questions of people online. One great. One. They were supposed to be in the chat. They're not in the chat. They're doing the wrong thing. Oh, sorry, they're in the Q&A, sorry. God damn it, I'm so pissed. Are they from the Stetson students? Uh, <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know, but only one of them, according to... Okay, them. good, good. So uh, the first one is from uh, Dominic. Okay. Uh, how do you get yourself into an intention that makes musical sense? For example, do you think the instrument has its own personality or does your personality or emotional responses find the right notes? Okay, good questions. So um, uh, again, you're hearing from me. So therefore you're hearing from my filter and my wrong and right. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm anti making sense. Um, I'm pissed off about common sense, about making sense, uh, about doing the right thing at the right time. 
And I think I've learned a lot by doing the opposite of all those things, like looking at what is the right thing at the right time and starting by doing the, the polar opposite of that and then seeing what that gave me and then finding the continuum between those those imaginary endpoints. Um, second thing I want to say about the making sense situation, one time I was in a rehearsal with Mark Rabot, a beautiful guitar player, and we were playing the dumbest, most boring piece of music, just straight out, just stupid. And Chess and I, the drummer, were looking at each other. We were making eyes at each other at the rehearsal, like, what is, what are we doing? And then we finished, and Mark said, um, the thing is, sometimes you have to drop into something that is wrong, that's the wrong thing for the time, that you're playing and the audience is literally thinking, this is terrible. And we do that so that there is then the place to blossom from with the next object you might start. And that was early on enough in my time playing music that I thought, that's amazing. The idea to go on stage and not want to wow the audience, not want to be read as beautiful or good or uh, skilled or any of those things. Uh, that was really excellent. Okay, second half of the question. Um, I tend to be moved by the structure of the thing that I'm holding. And that's why it's exciting to switch. Because uh, let me do my best to, to explain this. Um, initially, your brain is a flat surface. And then you have a thought, and that thought makes a groove in the surface. Like I might think, pizza is my favorite food. Then the more times I keep thinking that thought, the groove gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So on that flat surface, if you pour water on it, where is the water going to most easily drop into? It's going to drop into the valleys that have been cut by repeated thoughts. And so when you pick up an instrument, the instrument has a sort of innate structure that is speaking to you that is a little bit like a flat surface with a certain pattern of cut valleys. So when you lay your like water of intention onto that instrument, that water will make patterns and run in rivulets along those cut valleys of the structure of that instrument. And so therefore, when you pick up a different instrument, you pour the same water out of the same carafe of your spirit, let's say, and then it will make different forms because of the previously cut valleys of the structure of that instrument. That is the best I can do with that question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Alea. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask- Alea? Yes, Alea. Where is Alea located? Is she a Stetson student? No, she's your associate. Oh, hi. Oh, hey. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, what are, what are the sorts of things you learn to look for in a fellow collaborators? Mm. Uh, and has your process of collaboration changed over the years? I look for... Um, I look for just simply um, a collaborator saying, let's collaborate. I think that's all I'm looking for because I'm still so excited by intense diversity. For example, um, on, on any given moment, I can open up what I'm doing. I'm going to try and see if there's an example here that's useful. Um, let me see very quickly. Okay. So, for example, tomorrow I'm going to do a little bit of recording with a guitar player named Leo Abrahams, who is Brian Eno's primary guitar player for a lot of his records. And we're just going to make um, pieces using one rubber band held against the laptop mic and recording uh, you know, over Zoom, just back and forth. Um, then I'm going to record some screaming sounds for a dance score, like a dance theater score. Um, and then I'm going to drive to Philadelphia and uh, play a concert um, with this woman, Aruj Aflab, who's a Pakistani singer. 
Um, I, I, what I'm trying to say is that I'm, I'm just looking for let's collaborate and that's it. Like as wide as possible, as much of a different orientation of people as possible. Um, there was a second part to the question I wanted to remember right now. Can you tell me really quick, Ivan? Hold on. Has it changed over the years? Oh yeah, year? yeah. Here's how it's changed over time. Um, it, again, you're listening, you're hearing from me. So this is my filter of my right and wrong. That's the best I can do. The way it's changed over time is do less. I mean, I totally blew it by doing too much all the time. I think the less you do, the better you do at it. And I wish I wish I had known that earlier, but now's the time that I know that. Okay. Uh, I guess that's it for questions. Oh, you have one? Oh, okay. Okay. Wait. Go ahead, Amma. Hold on. Hello. It's uh, Amma. Hello, Amma. Hey. Um, and I, I was wondering, uh, you used the banjo and uh, also how you use the um, uh, hand pan. They were so uh, alternative, uh, uh, interesting uh, expressions of how to use that instrument. So I wanted to know like how you go about choosing which instruments you use. And then are you gravitating towards like traditional African-American instruments and then superimposing or juxtaposing how they're usually used in, and creating a, a different uh, lexicon of sounds out of them than we usually see? It's a good, super good question. So um, I tend to choose instruments by virtue of traveling a lot, like pre-COVID, traveling a lot through the world, landing somewhere, looking at what is uh, folkloric or indigenous to that space, going out, getting an instrument, finding someone that plays it traditionally and understanding a little bit about the language of it, and then bringing it back home and totally disrespectfully playing it in the way that, that I feel like. And the reason I'd say that, not partic too particularly tug-in-cheek, is that um, uh, I, I keep wanting to preface this by saying that it's my filter and my understanding of the world because it's so uh, opinionated, but all of us are. Um, I feel like nothing is that old. Like, what are we, what are we doing? Like we are as humans, what are we like 50,000, 100,000 years old? And the fucking piano is what, like 400 years old? And you expect me to respect it as an instrument, as a history? You expect me to approach it and think like, this instrument deserves to be played in this way by these people uh, with this historical representation and these pieces. No way, because it's all new. It's all recent. It's all totally fictitious. The piano is fictitious. Its history and lexicon is fictitious. It was made up on the spot. Like it was like a match that was just lit, just lit and is just being held in front of you on fire. And someone says, well, matches, they must be lit this way, they must be held this way, they must be respected. It's a match that was just lit and in fact is about to go out. Like, are you telling me that when the asteroid hits, anyone is gonna care about the, the respect of what a piano should be and to widen that, the tabla drum or the ungoni fiddle or on and on and on. All these things feel to me like instances of randomness where some humans collected around a sound and then codified it and then repeated it. And then some people suggest that we should respect that repetition and redo it. But I still feel like the coolest thing is 20 or 50,000 years ago, we, we were in an original feeling to make sound can we always play from that point of view prior to this whole piano equal temperament, uh, Messian, Debussy, on and on and on. It's all fiction that's been, that's so recent. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about that quickly is uh, it's so fun to do um, mismatching on occasion and just see what it brings you. For example, um, 
this has probably been seen by by many folks these days, but I still want to do it anyway right now. So it's been I've been having a lot of uh, appreciation bowing the banjo, which is not a traditional use of the banjo because the banjo has a flat bridge, and a flat bridge means that all the strings sound at the same time, as opposed to a violin that has a curved bridge. But what's cool is it sounds like this. Okay, so that's the best I could do with that answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Hold on, we got one person, uh, Valerie. So okay. it's Val. Hi, Val. Vermont. Did you say uh, Val from Vermont? I did, yeah. Nice. I'm going to take Dorothy's all kingdom. the way back to uh, Sonia's first question. Mm -hmm. When you talked about spreading out laterally. Mm-hmm. Wait, sorry, one sec, Val. You just to see this person. No, that was that was someone who's coming in and she was just coming in to say, Can I have the car keys? Because I have to pick up my daughter shortly. But tell me, please. And let me also just quickly tell her I'm coming with her. Just one sec. Okay, Val, I'm ready. Go. Um, so my question is, have you ever gotten lost? Has it ever been hard to pull back? from where you've spread? Um, short answer is no. And sur like surprisingly, strangely, I, we all have the, old, we have, we have the brains that we got and the sort of like brain dispositions that we got. I have this one that's like always knowing where you are. And so my, int my interest or struggle has been the getting lost part. And which is why I'm so grateful that in playing music occasionally, I get to that lost space. I'm improvising with someone, I'm making some sound, and then suddenly it's 10 minutes later and something transpired and I was so deep in it that I wasn't aware of the room, I wasn't aware of where I was geographically. And so I haven't ever been lost where I couldn't return from the spread and I really appreciate and value getting lost because it doesn't happen very easily. Thank you, Shazad. I know that you have to go pick up, uh, or pick, I imagine you need to go somewhere. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and performing for us. Thanks so much. It was wonderful to be with all of you.